Hello, welcome to The Rest is History. And um, this is an episode that I have been looking forward to a long time. Um, Dominic, ever since we, we began doing this series, there have been yep. certain episodes that uh, we've kind of mapped out. Um, and this, for me, is definitely one of them because my wife, Sadie, is a midwife. Um, and so... You have I, talked I, of nothing else, I, well, no, I think it's, it's fair to say. I have very, very much wanted to do uh, an episode on the hi history of childbirth, the history of midwifery, because, yeah. of course, being married to a midwife, it makes you very, very interested in of the course. subject. But also um, you've been sending me endless messages saying, I will get so much credit at home <laughs> when we do this childbirth episode. I can't wait. I don't well, know what, you th what benefits you, or rewards you think are going to be flowing your way, Tom. <laughs> Well, I, th I think that the joy of seeing my beloved wife listen to um, an absolutely listen splendid to, episode. Listen to yourself. <laughs> listen to you. No, because we have we have a, a wonderful we guest do. to talk about. We it, do. do we not? Who, so who do we have? Two, so obviously, as two men, we're not really <laughs> equipped to talk about the history of childbirth. I mean, admittedly, a lack of a lack of knowledge and experience has never hampered us in the past. But we thought that this time we'd have a proper expert. So we have um, Sarah Reed, who is I'm very happy to say, who is a um, a literary historian, senior lecturer from Loughborough University. And not only has she written loads about women's experiences and women's bodies in the early modern period, she's also the author of a historical novel called The Gossip's Choice, which I think she's going to tell us the interesting link with midwifery in a second. And she's got a book called The Midwife's Truth out in September. And that's what we're after, Tom, isn't it? The Midwife's Truth. It is. So I'm hoping you're going to tell us all about the midwife's truths, <laughs> as it were, um, today. So welcome to the show. Thank you. That was nicely done. Yes, the Gossip's Choice is about a midwife practising in 1665 against the backdrop of the Great Plague. And it's called the Gossip's Choice because gossips were the women who attended other women in childbirth. So my midwife is the best midwife in the area. She's the Gossip's Choice. She's the one you want. So a gossip, hold on. Is that where the word gossip comes from? Yes. So... Gossip derives from the same root as godparent um, and is God's helper, if you like. It's God's representative. And so the women who accompanied other women through their labour and supported her, propped her up quite literally, you know, sat behind her and, um, and gave her strength, were known as gossips. And then, of course, you've got people worrying about what's going on in these all-female environments and the conversations that may or may not be going on. And so you get the sort of broad, broad use of gossip as we know it today. Oh, Tom, I bet you didn't know that. Did you know that? I, di I didn't know that. Um, but it's so, I mean, it's a kind of interesting point that for, for men, in a sense, childbirth is the, the, the sphere perhaps where men are most likely to feel excluded and that therefore men have written the histories. And so to an extent in looking at the kind of the broad sweep of how men have written about childbirth do you, have you picked up a kind of sense of, of, of suspicion, of hesitation, of doubt, of uncertainty of the kind that would explain how it is that gossip comes to have the kind of pejorative term that it does today? Well, men written with about childbirth with uh, consummate confidence over the years. So even in the 17th century, you've got midwives pushing back on men writing about childbirth. So famously, Nicholas Culpepper, the hypocrisy that we've all heard of from the Civil War era, wrote and translated a number of midwifery uh, textbooks um, but you know was widely believed never to have been in a birthing chamber himself but that didn't stop him writing with authority <laughs> on the topic <laughs> interestingly after his death his wife then registers as a midwife um, so there was a family interest in it but um, he personally hadn't got any experience but that didn't stop him writing and so nearly all the contemporary texts that I work on um, are written by men so so if you if you go all the way back and I'm going to do Melvin Bragg go back to ancient Greece was the that first... your Melvin Bragg Tom Yes, back to Witcher Greece. All this time, and it's a terrible impersonation. I thought it was quite a good one. Well, what do you think, Sarah? I'm going to be discreet, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that tells us own story. Brilliant. So, so <laughs> am I right, Sarah, that the first named midwife is an Athenian called Agnadike? Who may not have existed at all. Right. <laughs> right. It's largely now thought by a classicist that it's a myth rather than a real historical figure. Um, and one group grew up from the idea of women being excluded from the academy and not being able to have the formal training in medicine that uh, men could receive at that time. But sort of, but she disguises herself, doesn't she, as a man? Um, so, so when so is this? Is this in sort of classical the age of Pericles fourth century BC? Okay, 
so century yeah. after Pericles. So yeah, this story grows up that um, this this woman wants to attend women, and the only way she can do that, or she can send women in, but to get the advanced knowledge, she needs to be um, in the company of physicians, um, and she can't get access without disguising herself as a man. Um, the story falls down on um, on the idea that there was no formal registration process for men at that time either. So, you know, it's, it's all a little bit woolly about where, where it came from and, and what was going on with that story. But it's certainly um, a myth that's, that's been passed down through the ages. But because what strikes me about that is that I had always assumed that women were, were the midwives, mm. that, 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 that this, was, this was pretty much a given. But is that not the case in, say, I don't know, in in the ancient world in Greece or whatever, no, is, it, is, it, is it men who have a responsibility for attending women in labour? It's always been the case that women have attended other women. So again, it adds another layer to the confusion of the story. Where men and physicians were called in is if there were complications, if things were going wrong, if they needed some sort of you know advanced care, and that carries on right throughout time. So it may well be that um, to get the rudimentary sort of everyday caring skills that um, a midwife needed at the time that was that was fine and that was done sort of with knowledge transfer between women but um this character who probably wasn't real wanted to get more knowledge more theoretical knowledge and to get that she would need to pass herself off as a man i see so so i'll tell you who is absolutely a a, a brilliant expert on midwifery uh, and has some absolutely splendid advice uh, dominic can you guess who it is he's a, a top roman Mansplainer. The, the Emperor Caligula? No, it's Pliny the Elder. <laughs> okay, that doesn't surprise me with you. So, so here, here is some top midwifery advice some, uh, from Pliny. Um, it is said that, it is said that, yeah, a difficult labour comes immediately to term if, over the house where the woman giving birth is lying, someone throws a stone or a missile that has killed with a single stroke three living creatures, a human being, a boar, and a bear. And he goes on to specify that the best um, missile is a light cavalry spear. Sarah, how plausible. I mean, that's completely <laughs> laughable, isn't it? I mean, did people were people out spearing boars and bears on the off chance that you know, in a few years they'd need this missile to guarantee them a, an air or something? It seems very unlikely to me. But it's a very specific item to find as well, isn't it? It's got to have killed three different kinds of yes. creatures. Yeah. <laughs> and you've simply got to get hold of one. I mean, that, that phrase pops up in quite a lot of the, um, the texts that I read, simply get hold of this, that or the other. And you think, well, that doesn't sound remotely simple, actually. <laughs> Where is that kind of stuff coming from? Because presumably the the kind of the border zone between um, midwifery care and magic, there's always been a sense of blurring there, do you think? I think there is a, in every situation where there are unknowns and, and things seem quite miraculous. I mean, the, the birthing process is one of those, isn't it, where it does, it does seem quite miraculous and therefore it leaves itself open to, these, to the magic uh, line blurring. But the idea that objects, inanimate objects, took on qualities was broadly held. So the, the, the stone then takes on certain qualities from the experiences it's had. Let me ask a, a question that we got from um, Karis, I think it is, um, on, our, on our Discord channel for the Rest is History Club members. So Karis says, what do we know about the average age of first-time mothers over the centuries? So what, and what is the optimal age for giving birth? So in other words, when we're talking about childbirth and midwifery and so on, um, in periods before our own, we're generally talking about people who are giving birth much younger than the, the, the average British woman does today, aren't we? Well, not in the early modern period, no. Um, popular understandings of this are skewed by the fact that um, aristocracy and people of higher ranks got married much younger than the average Joe in the street did. So the average age for marriage in the early modern period, so we're talking about the 17th century mainly, was, bet- was about 24 for a woman, 26 for a man. All oh, right, so so much later than you would. But does that does marriage map on? Does the age of marriage, and maybe this is a too too banal a question, does that map onto the age of childbirth? In other words, some people presumably would be giving birth before marriage, obviously. Mm. Mm. Um, so, do we know what the average age was where people had their first child? Um, not not really, but we do know that up to a third of women were pregnant when they got married. In the 17th century? In yeah, the 17th century, yeah, in the 16th, yeah. 16th, 17th century, it's been estimated from looking at um, marriage lines and 
uh, birth records in church records. You can see, I mean, people like uh, famously William Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway. Um, she was expecting yeah. their eldest when they uh, when they got wed. So that's that's quite normal. And the reason that it is quite normal is because of the betrothal um, arrangements. Whereas when a couple get engaged now, it's sort of just you know an understanding between them. Whereas betrothal was a bit more than that in the past. It was um, a firm promise, a commitment, and once that had been shared between the couple and their families and the wider community, then um, often people would begin sleeping together because you know they were married in all but name at, at that point. You're responsible for, for childbirth in the 17th century. Are you drawing on folk wisdom when you you attend a labour? Or are you drawing on the kind of the legacy that Pliny gives you and you're <laughs> chucking stones over houses and things? Or are there other traditions that you're drawing on? To what extent is, 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 is it formalised? Where are these traditions coming from? The first English language midwifery guide appears in 1540. And it's a translation of a much translated text that originally comes from German and appears in nearly every continental language and it is at some point translated into Latin and it's from the Latin that we get the English translation. And so from 1540, that text in various forms stays in print for well over 70 years. You're still seeing versions of it in the 1620s. What's it called? It's called um, The Birth so... of Mankind. The birth, oh, very good. The yeah. Birth of Mankind or The Woman's Book is its subtitle. Um, and so that, that appears all across Europe and there's a whole um, flurry of midwifery texts from this time onwards in the English language. And they draw their learning, um, the theoretical knowledge, from the ancients, so from Galen and from the Hippocratic texts. Um, nearly all the, the theoretical knowledge in these books is quite similar, and it's all drawing on that, um, that body of knowledge that's been handed down from the ancients. So that's where medicine is coming from. Midwifery is coming slightly differently. It's coming from training that's hands-on, you know, so mothers training their daughters um, and, and that sort of thing. So when you get the first midwifery guide that's written with a woman's name, Jane Sharp, in 1671, she's drawing on a lot of the uh, ideas that are present in certain of the texts, so certainly ones that were translated by Nicholas Culpepper and people like that who is taking works from a, a body of authors, but also she's, she's reading widely. She's picking the best bits that she thinks are the most applicable. But what she says is that to be a good midwife, you need to have uh, speculative knowledge. So you need to have theoretical knowledge and you need to have practical knowledge. You need to have the hands-on experience. And she said the very best midwives have got a combination of both. So she, that's where she's coming into print um, in 1671 with, with that idea. So, so talk us through... Um... You you become pregnant in the at the end of the 16th century or the be the beginning of the early modern period, let's say, and um, you're of the middling sort. What do you, what happens? So do you do you withdraw to your? I mean, I, I have that the haziest, most probably utterly inaccurate view of what happens. So I have this sort of sense that you withdraw at some point and are not seen for weeks before your due date or whatever, and then there's people sequestered in the room with you and your husband is waiting outside. But is that completely wrong? I mean, what? how does it work? Yeah, that, that doesn't apply to sort of middling sorts or um, everyday people. Some of that may have come from accounts of royalty um, and yeah. aristocracy. That tells you the way my mind works. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> who've, who've got access to the funds to live um, you know, that sort of a life. But for most women, it would be a question of um, carrying on working. In the family business, as you know, most families ran cottage industries from home. Most trade was done like that, wasn't it? So everybody participated in the family occupation, whatever that might be. And there wasn't the finances or the wherewithal generally for women to retire and stop working. And so what you would find was that um, women would carry on pretty much as normal until their labour pain started. And then what happens? Then what happens is that you call the midwife and normally your husband is the one who's sent off. So you see in men's diaries from the era, um, people like Ralph Jocelyn uh, will write how they were sent off to find the midwife because um, the woman had gone into labour. And at that point, um, certain ritualistic processes can kick in. So the midwife, we might think that the first thing the midwife does is to do a medical assessment and things like that. But in the 17th century, your midwife is much more likely to gather everybody to say a prayer because the link between religion and midwifery is very strong. And so there would be a sort of communal prayer for a happy delivery, for a happy outcome. Uh, and from then on, 
the midwife was in charge. This was her domain. And around the woman who was laboring would be a group of friends, neighbors, the gossips that we started out our conversation talking about. They might be her mother. They might be her mother-in-law. They might not all be her choosing. It might not, <laughs> not be, um, you know, it might be politic to have certain people there. Surely the last person you want is your mother-in-law. Right? But, it, but it would be a public affair. W would it? I mean, it, it would, would be, be a community affair. A, a community affair. Yes, definitely. And that was important because part of what you're doing is you're introducing the infant into your community, acknowledging them in a very public way. And so the father sending for the midwife um, is all part of that process of um, making this baby be born into its community rather than just now in the sort of nuclear family that we often um, live in. That's very alien to people in the 17th century. So yeah, so it would be a very community-led process. So you would have neighbours, um, as I say, some family, and the midwife was in charge. You talked about the role of religion. Just two questions on that. One from Amy VC. How has the Christian idea that childbirth ought to be painful, as described in Genesis, so that's the curse uh, put on Eve by God, mm. influenced medical developments in obstetrics? But just before that, this is a question from Sadie, my wife who has an incredible collection of um, medieval paintings mm. of the, the Virgin giving birth to Jesus in which there are midwives. And she asked, she wanted, wanted um, is there anything useful that can be learned about the history of childbirth from all the medieval paintings that show midwives attending the Virgin's labor? So I guess there are the, the idea that childbirth should be painful, which you get in Genesis, and the idea that the Virgin giving birth to Jesus then kind of washes away that mm. sin. It makes childbirth very, very important in, in the way that Christians understand the world. It absolutely does. So um, thinking about the medieval paintings that have got lots of midwives and the Virgin, midwives are all associated with religion and with it being um, part of a religious du duty going back to the sort of early Christianity. And Jane Sharp, who I mentioned a few moments ago, opens her book by claiming the role of midwife as set out in um, giving an example from Exodus. And she says that, um, and let me read a little bit of here. She says, you know, it's extremely requisite that a midwife be both fearing God, faithful and exceedingly well experienced in that profession. Her fidelity shall not shall not only a reward here from man, but God hath given special example in Exodus 1 in the mis midwives of Israel, who were so faithful to their trust that the command of a king could not make them depart from it. And she goes on to say that, you know, because of their behaviour in Exodus, God gave them this special status. Oh, that's brilliant. I would say you'd be delighted to know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just on the question of midwives, because you said, you know, you had the, this sort of image um, that I think we're probably all kind of familiar with of the sort of the husband rushing to get the midwife. Who are the midwives? So, mm -hmm. so at what point do you decide to become a midwife? Are they, is it random? Well, what, what I mean is, is there somebody in a given village who is absolutely the midwife and everybody turns to that person? Or could the midwife be a more informal kind of role? Yes, both. <laughs> so in every parish, generally, there would be a former midwife. And that's somebody who's got a license to practice as a midwife. A license? A license. Right. Now, licensing... And who is issuing the license? Well, the licensing came in in the early 16th century, so it's a Tudor thing. And it's an ecclesiastical license to practice. So the bishop decides if you're going to be a good midwife or not. And How does the bishop know? I mean, he's, <laughs> well, he's a bishop. <laughs> yeah. He knows because to get a license, it's a complicated and expensive, uh, fairly um, arduous ordeal to get a midwifery license. So you need to have testimonials. You need to have about six women who can vouch for you. And normally it'd be their husbands writing a letter of recommendation or signing their name, even if it was with an X, um, to say that you had attended their birth and that you behave properly as you would expect and everything was fine so you need testimonials and then you need to take an oath uh, the midwife's oath but there's various versions of this throughout the two centuries that it applied because it sort of dies out in the 1730s um, it never comes to a formal end but it just stops happening and these these oaths include things like promising that you will treat rich and poor alike that you won't go off mid attendance of a poorer woman to go and attend to a rich woman where you'll get a much greater fee promising that you know you'll be a good godly woman um, and that's part of what the church is looking for and you have to also promise things like that if the child dies in the delivery that you will make sure they're decently buried uh, and that involves finding a decent place not in consecrated ground because the child wouldn't be baptized 
but some where they couldn't be dug up accidentally by a dog or a pig, for example. So treating the child's um, body with respect, and, and that would be your responsibility. So this, this midwife, so is quite involved, you know, and some, some of them have got up to 15 clauses that you're agreeing to. But this is all done by the church. So it's a church that keeps the register. And every visitation, when the bishop goes on his tours, and visits parishes, the licences come up for renewal in a, not in a formal sense that you present something, you're given something, but you know, in the, is, is, is Mrs. So-and-so still doing well and can I see her and talk to her and this sort of thing. So the church was very much involved for a 200 year period. And again, it comes back to the importance of midwifery as a religious duty. So you have licensed midwives. They may be, depending on the size of the area, you know, there might be more than one of those, but they're trained by a sort of apprenticeship system. So up to six years, sometimes as little as three. In 1737, Sarah Stone, who's a, a midwife from Bristol, uh, originally from Somerset, she writes that three years is enough. Other people thought six. And midwives often called their apprentices their deputy uh, and they, they travelled around together and eventually the deputy would gain enough experience to, to do a delivery and once they'd got a certain number then they could start thinking about applying to be a midwife in their own right. But at the other end of the scale and where there wasn't a, a licensed midwife, there would be hand women, sort of the same derivative as farm hand, and they would just be the local woman who'd got lots of experience in childbirth, she probably had a you know, number of children herself. She was the one that people called to, but she'd never gone down the formal licensing route. And that sort of raises a question from Simon G, another of our uh, club members. He says, um, to what extent were midwives marginalised as witches by a predominantly male clerical and medical establishment as medicine began to be codified in the early modern period? So were, mi were some midwives sometimes seen as witches, no. Sarah? No. No. So no, that's, um, a, that's a myth. Yeah. In, uh, right back in the late 80s, um, David Harley writes at length about this and finds no evidence for midwif midwives being treated as witches. So that's a sort of urban, that's an urban myth. Yeah. Because, yeah. I, I mean, anyone who has seen Call the Midwife, an incredibly successful drama uh, set against the backdrop of the East End in the 50s and 60s, will know how central the fact that, that it is under the aegis of nuns mm. is. I mean, the, the religion is really important there. And I hadn't realised quite how kind of interwoven it was even back in the, in the 16th and 17th centuries, but I guess I get kind of obvious that it was. Could we take a break now? And, and perhaps, Sarah, we could, at, at the end of the second half, look at Call the Midwife, but we should, there are a couple of um, questions on, say, caesarean sections and on swaddling, which mm. would be oh, right. wonderful to come to after the break, and then look at how midwifery evolved over the course of the 17th, 18th century into the modern period. So we will be back after the break. Thanks very much. Hello, welcome back to uh, The Rest is History. We are talking childbirth, midwifery, all that kind of stuff. And there's an excellent uh, question here from Dr. Crom, who is a classicist. And he says, I trust there'll be a caesarean section. Very, very good. Very good, Jay. <laughs> That's the sort of wit we expect from our listeners. <laughs> we've, so we've had a lot of questions about this. Uh, Huell, is it true Julius Caesar was the first baby born by caesarean section? Uh, David N., could you pass the history of the caesarean section and the use in various cultures? Also, is there any truth to the idea this is how Caesar himself was born? And so on. So <laughs> Julius Caesar, caesarean sections, what's going on there? Yeah, it's a really, it's a, it's a funny one, this, because... You see repeatedly the idea that it was Julius Caesar. Well, if it was Julius Caesar, it wasn't the person that we're thinking of. It was one of his ancestors. Because <laughs> yeah, his mother lives, doesn't she? <laughs> exactly. And that's rather, rather um, closes the case. Uh, for so, but you do see in every culture, as far as I can say, there is examples of great people supposedly being born through um, surgical intervention, so through caesarean sections. So it's something that comes into most cultures, this idea that a person born to greatness would have been born in this exceptional way. So there's no... Duff. <laughs> not from woman, duff. That's right, not from a woman born. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's very pervasive, but um, very unlikely. Up until... The really up until the 19th century, the late 19th century at that, what we think of as a modern cesarean didn't have any um, precedence, you know, with, with the invention of sort of anaesthesia and antisepsis, that people could have cesarean sections and still thrive. You will see stories throughout history of people who, you know, supposedly had them and went on to have more children and survived. But how, you know, how true these are, we just don't know. But it's not until, as I say, we get into um, 
the late 19th century, we've got what we called, you know, documentary evidence for it happening. Babies were born by surgical means, but uh, as Tom alluded to, it was when the mother, we'd given up hopes for the mother. So it was a way of saving the child and it was very successful for that. So if the mother was going to die anyway, then let's try and save the child by surgical means. So that, that happened, yeah. So let's talk about mortality mm. because we had loads of questions about that. So, for example, Dave Walters has asked, did mortality rates improve over time or did they actually get worse? And just following up, so, so that's one question. And then the follow-up question is, is from Tim Basby Burney. And he asks, given that there were obviously high risks of death compared with the figures now, did men and women prepare themselves for death, i.e. did husband and wife kind of say almost a tearful farewell? and the expectation that things might go horribly wrong. So, mm. so yeah, what's the story with mortality? Yeah, so let, I'll do the second part um, first. They, they did prepare themselves, and um, there's a beautiful poem by uh, the American poet Anne Bradstreet, who published, uh, her poems were published in the 1650s, and she's got um, a poem called Before the Birth of One of My Children, and it's written to her husband, and I regularly reread it I teach it every year and I can't get through it without um, tearing up it is just so touching she talks about how if if she is to die that she hopes her husband will look after their existing children she knows he'll remarry um, because that's what you do but she says you know if you ever loved me then look after these children and don't let them come to any harm from their new stepdame but she lived. Please tell me she lived. She lived. She lived. <laughs> oh, my God. I, uh, I thought she, Tom was going to dissolve then. In a... <laughs> yeah, so I, I can't recommend that more highly, really. So people did prepare themselves. There were whole um, publications. The Mother's Legacy is a genre of publication in the early modern period in which mothers would write instructions for their children so that if anything happened to them. There's even one from the early 17th century where the mother suggests names for her grandchildren. <laughs> so they didn't oh, wow. to me, this is what I want to happen. Um, but you often get, you know, instructions for good behavior and and things like that in these mother's legacies more generally there were prayers that were written specially for laboring women in the early stages or that she could offer up throughout her pregnancy uh, to prepare her soul for the worst so absolutely it was something that was very much on people's minds having said that the statistics are very much lower than um, we think and they do get worse as your questioner suspected so in the late 17th century the figure is 1.7% for maternal mortality in some studies that have been based on church records. We're talking about one to two per hundred, which sounds lower than we, we tend to think, but still means if we think about our wider network, that we're going to know somebody or know of somebody, aren't we? Even mm. if it's second yeah. hand or third hand removed. Um, but childbirth generally um, was very safe and you know, we're, talk we're talking over 98 out of 100 having a happy outcome f for the mother. And then, and then you said it gets worse, though. That's the interesting thing. So why would it get worse? Well, the figure that I've got is that in 1933, it's 5.94. So why is that, do you think? Well, it's to do with, I want to say men, involved right. <laughs> well, it might not be very... Um, yeah, but Just it, say it, it's fine. It, it's <laughs> to do with the medicalisation and the, right. the way that... Um, Physicians were routinely involved in childbirth and they're going from the classic example is they've gone from a uh, postmortem or from chopping somebody's leg off, wipe their hands down on their apron and go to yeah. the birth. And they're introducing yeah. germs into the birthing chamber, which wouldn't otherwise have been there. So the rates of puerperal fever, or childbed fever, go through the roof. Oh, so that's interesting. So it's not because the men are recommending techniques that are too invasive or too intrusive or, 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 or sort of aggressive. It's because they have been operating on other people and they, they're, they're basically bringing in, mm. you know, the infection. That's, that's the, the major thing. Yeah, that, is, that does seem to be the major thing. Um, but the, also that they would be the ones who came into a difficult birth. So if, if surgical intervention in the form of forceps or something was needed, then it would be a man who would do that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there is higher um, cases for things going so, so that process by which um, childbirth comes to be medicalized is, is obviously really interesting. So but just before we come to that, could I just w ask one other question from uh, Nikki Rathbone? Uh, and she's asking about swaddling. Mm. Why was it so universal from the Middle East to Native Americans for thousands of years? Mm. And why is it no longer practiced? Is it still practiced? It is still practiced, yeah. I mean, I remember one of mine um, not settling in the hospital and the midwife came in and um, 
wrapped them up very, very tightly in their blanket and handed me back a pacified infant. And I thought you know, some, something miraculous had just taken <laughs> place. But swaddling is incredibly effective for um, soothing infants. So, so it's as simple as that. It, it, it works is basically the answer. It works. And that, that's the simple answer. But it also had theory behind it. Um, so midwives would write, Jane Sharp would write, for example, that um, swaddling children is essential for their limbs to grow straight. And that's what you want is strong, straight limbs. So if you swaddle them tight, you know, you lay them out nicely and swaddle them tightly, then that would encourage their limbs to, you know, to settle into a straight formation. And then um, it was t- there was timetables for unswaddling. So at about four months, you might then release the infant's arms. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, then, and then move right. on. So, so it talks a lot about midwives. I have a question about fathers. Right. What are they doing? Are they helping or are they loitering outside, looking at their phone, talking about the football, <laughs> having a cigarette? Um, yeah. 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 Um, so are there some who get involved? Is that, or is that, are they never welcome? They're not really welcome. I mean, you do get odd examples of the father being there because something's happening and they, they need to get involved. But also, you know, if you think about people who live in quite close, um, close confinements, then, you know, people were trying to get on with their lives around these continual um, births yeah. every couple of years. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't that they were completely absent. They weren't welcome in the birth chamber. It was go and find something to do. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you well, know. Well, actually, Dominic, that sets up this question perfectly. It's another question from Sadie. And I very much get the, the impression that she's asking on behalf it's a of... a very nepotistic of, show, Tom. <laughs> of, 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 of every midwife, because she says that this is apparently a common myth among midwives. Is it true that Louis the Fourteenth had a fetish for watching women give birth and that this led to the practice of women giving birth on their backs? Well, I wouldn't like to um, comment on what Louis XIV's fetishes were, but um, he certainly is on record as having um, watched deliveries and insisted on being present. Um, And again, I mean, in a way, royal births are very different from everyday births, so there would be a chamber full of people. I mean, um, royal women have the sort of ordeal of having to give birth in a sort of public yes. way, don't they? Um, and, and the royal physician would be at hand and... Because um, otherwise bedpans and... Exactly, all kind of, yeah. Yes, all that malarkey. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the story goes, doesn't it, that um, Louis XIV wanted to be there at all the births, including his mistresses and, and things like that, and he was just fascinated by the process. But it wasn't him, really, who had any influence over what the wider population were doing. But one of his contemporaries, so um, a Pari- Parisian physician... Francis Mauricio, who wrote a book in French in 1668 on childbirth, and it was later translated into English. And in his book, he talks about women getting onto the bed when they're due to um, go into the final stages and start pushing. Um, all people at this time believe that the best thing, an act, what we would now call an active labour, that women are encouraged to, to go to for. Squat. To walk about, squat, yeah, absolutely, yeah. birthing balls. All the, so they used to have birthing birthing chairs, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's examples of that going back to antiquity, of birthing stones being these sort of passed along, um, you know, the family. And birthing chairs, yeah, was part of a midwife's kit would be um, to have some sort of a stool. Like, they could be very simple affairs, like a dairy, dairy stool, a three-legged dairy stool. Um, and the ones you see with, with examples like that, they've got no back and you think, well, that can't be very comfortable. But that's where your gossip's coming across. They're stood behind you. They're being the mm. back. They're supporting the friend or the family member in labour and somebody else might be holding her arms. Um, and even if a woman did give birth on a bed at, at the time that we're talking about in the late 17th century, it would often be with, with one of the gossips sat behind her holding her. So it'd be semi-recumbent. So what we're talking about in, in Louis XIV's time is, is a move towards a sort of semi-recumbent position. And Francis... And why, what's driving that? Well, he, Mauricio is writing that that's um, the most optimal position for opening the pelvis. So he says that women should sort of become semi-recumbent and put their feet against something solid and, and sort of bring their legs up open. And that will, that will give the best sort of way for the baby to be born and the best air the best way of the mother breathing so that's his that's his motivation for writing that but why he's had the reputation for being the person who wrote this and was the first person and he is practicing at the same time as um louis XIV was was in charge that passage um came from aristotle right <laughs> Right. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a long-held sort of view 
in some sort of circles. But I think the reason you don't see it circulating more widely is because it's just not what people routinely did. So, so women now lie down on their backs to give birth because of Aristotle. Well, they don't live. Die, they don't lie down on the backs now, though, do they? No, I mean, they did for a sort of period, didn't they, in the twentieth century, when it was it was the only way it was sort of allowed. Um, so, I've got a question actually from from a friend of mine called Marina Colville, um, and uh, she and her husband are great fans of the show. And she sent me a long email with her question, in which is about the medicalization of childbirth. And mm. she says, you know, has has it, does a lot of historical research concentrate on it as a kind of medical event rather than as it were a natural event? And have we moved on as a society, or why haven't we moved on, sort of taking it out of the realm of, of the medical where you need a sort of doctor on hand and seeing it as more natural? Where do you think the sort of the um, the focus is at the moment? Do people still see it as, as medical or do they see it as more part of, as it were, the natural, the natural processes of life? I think that there was um, a time when, because the medical textbooks were the most easily accessible source that we had to hand that there was um there was a tendency to to go down that route and look at what these textbooks were saying and to take that as if that was you know necessarily what happened in, in all cases and then there was also the structural changes in society so you start with the lying in hospitals in london from the mid 18th century and a process that takes actually hundreds of years to get yeah. to get women into hospitals but there are now a lot of people who are focused primarily and I think probably um you know going back to what I said about you know the work of in the 80s of people like Dale Fid Harley we were looking at midwifery there was always um a sort of acknowledgement about what women's experience was what women's lived experience was and there's a brand new book that only just came out last month giving birth in the 18th century um which is very much interested in women's experience and what it was like to be part of a community and what happened and that um is yeah is investigating what it was actually like I and mean, the title's brilliant because yeah. it just is about giving birth in the 18th century um so yeah so yeah we're, we're sort of addressing that in print a lot now and she asks a follow-up question which is why haven't all the research that's been done on the experiences of women and the lives of women and the sort of primacy of women's own experience of childbirth rather than that of the doctors and of the kind of medical profession why hasn't that improved uh, maternity services the question is i guess why is it still sort of quite top down and quite sort of focused on the doctor rather than on the the the, the mother or, or is that actually not a fair um description of it i think yeah i mean i think it can feel like that i think when you get into the system you can very much feel like it's top down and that women struggle to get their voices heard i don't know that that's you know that's the universal experience there's a great new program isn't there? the yorkshire midwife that's just started now um and it's about community midwives in yorkshire and how they're um facilitating home births and it's a wonderful uh, reality show this i think it's only had a couple of episodes aired which shows what's going on in bradford to listen to women and to facilitate wherever possible them giving birth at home those who would like to well so could i ask now about call the midwife mm. he's been dying to do this all the <laughs> well i think it's a, a fabulous piece of historical drama mm. because it takes you up close to look at how cultural assumptions evolve and change but also uh, it's about the infrastructure of how midwifery services are provided, isn't it? And how women come to give birth, because what you're seeing is simultaneously the improvements that a national health service bring to people in the, in the East End who, who previously, I assume, have, uh, are often at great risk. Mm. But at the same time, the midwife, it's, it's a group midwifery practice centered in, in a, a Nanata's house, a kind of religious community of nuns. Mm. The difficulty of inter ultimately of integrating that kind of approach with a more kind of top down nationalized approach. Mm. And do you think that I mean, what, what is your impression as a historian of, of childbirth and midwifery? What do you make of Call the Midwife? I draw Call the Midwife. Oh, and I, the early episodes, the early series, which are pre AHS, you can see how important that um, service yeah. that was offered by the nuns was um, to assisting the women of Poplar who were amongst the poorest in the country, living in overcrowded, overcrowded insanitary conditions. And they are based on the memoirs of Jennifer Worth, who was herself one of the nuns. Uh, one of she wasn't a nun; she was one of the midwives who worked in that sort of an environment. And so they are based on first-hand memoirs. And so, I mean, the later episodes, obviously, they're imagining uh, a continuity. Because they, they're going into the 60s, aren't they? But, they, you know, people sort of think of it as being sort of um, a little bit saccharine. But it's the opposite of that, I think, as a, as a no, historian. Yeah. They, you know, they deal with flamidamide and things like that, you know, um, tackling that sort of prime time viewing 
it, it's very brave and very important, I think. And so, yeah, I, I think and we know that the um, birth scenes on Call the Midwife are authentic because the um, clinical editor, Terry Coates, is involved in every aspect. So she oversees every single birth presentation. She's there working alongside uh, the production throughout. She looks after the babies because the babies, you know, are taken from really newborn babies that are, are, are starring roles. Terry oversees the way that this happens to make sure that it is authentic and realistic. I'm sure I wouldn't have watched it had Sadie not made me watch it. I was gripped absolutely from the beginning. And I think the reason why it's completely gripping, it, it's not just the the kind of Dickensian blend of, you know, make him laugh and make him cry, which it does very effectively on both levels. I can't think of a drama series that has shown the process of social change mm. in Britain quite so brilliantly. Um, and, and, and it brings home to you how central midwifery and childbirth is to, to a culture the way that it is understood and the way that, that kind of approaches to it evolve. Yeah, absolutely it does. So you get the, the, the very early parts of it when there was no concept of um, an NHS and women who couldn't afford to get help generally would, would be managed sort of in social groups, wouldn't it? It's basically with, with going back to the hand woman. Um, and you see the regular, um, the way that the NHS comes in and intervenes. And like you say, that, then that's got to be negotiated, hasn't it? Because now we've got this sort of monolithic organisation saying this is what's going to happen. And it, it tackles all that head on and it shows that the tensions that exist around the foundation of this new way of doing things. So we've got one last question, I think, Tom, which I think is the question that everybody's been looking forward to. So it's from Anthony Buck. This is probably um, a slightly harsh question to ask you, uh, Sarah, but I think everyone wants to know the answer. <laughs> Which of the two presenters of The Rest is History do you think would be the most effective birthing partner? <laughs> well, I think I, I think that's a very unfair question to spring on Sarah, who's only met us for <laughs> under an hour. Yes, I think first, first impressions are often very <laughs> revealing, Tom. I think, it, I think it would be Tom, actually. I, I've seen more episodes of Call the Midwife. Right, because all, that, all, that, all, that, all those hours spent watching Call the Midwife can't, you know, they've got to count for something. It's, it's all about the hot water. Hot water is and it? towels, Dominic. That's what it's all about. Well, that's I, what I would have assumed. Yeah. I'd, start, I'd do the prayer at first, I think. I'd, start, I'd kick <laughs> off with the prayer. It worked in the would. 17th century. I, actually, I've got one last question, and it's a, a very broad one. As a historian of, of, of childbirth, which is such a primal experience, what's more, what's more significant, the commonality of the experience or the differences that have affected how, how women give birth over the course of the centuries and across the sweep of the globe? I think it comes back to the commonalities for me. It is a, a physical process that, you know, is essentially the same over the years. The way that it's culturally determined through um, how you give, you know, the, the environment in which you give birth, so whether you're in a very sterile, medicalised environment, whether you're at home with support or whether you're just sort of surrounded by a group of friends and doing it as, as your body's dictating. Essentially, the process, the physical process of giving birth is the same throughout time. And reading uh, women's letters and diaries from the 17th century, as I do, they don't talk very much about the, the physical experience of giving birth, but they do talk about the processes as, as, as their family grows. And they do talk about their, their feelings towards the impending labour and they do talk about the physical recovery afterwards and things like that and you get you get a sense you know that you're reading the accounts of women who've been through this much the same as I did it, it connects you in a way with with women who lived hundreds of years ago brilliant well as you have connected us to them thanks so much for coming on um I hope everyone's enjoyed this uh, and we will be back again with more in due course thanks ever so much bye-bye goodbye bye-bye